All right, I, if you don't have something to write on, I wanna make sure you do. Grab something to write on. Um, you wanna write on someone's arm, you can do that. If you wanna write on, uh, you could write on your popcorn box. You got a box, you could get a pen and write on your popcorn box. You can open your, your phone and take some notes there. But there's some things we want you to take away today. And whether you've walked with Jesus a long time or whether this is brand new or whether it's exploratory. You're not sure, you haven't chosen Jesus yet. There are some things I think that as we talk today that you'll be able to take away that will be impactful and powerful in the way that you live and walk out your life that will be transformative. And so today's movie, for those of you that, that weren't aware, is Creed Three. And, uh, and yeah, who said, oh, where was that over there? Oh, oh, okay. So um, yeah, Creed Three, and uh, such a good movie, but I need to disclaim on the front end, right? There's some scenes in the movie that are bloody. There's, it's a boxing movie, you know what I'm saying? So um, there's some stuff. So there may be a little bit in some of our clips today that might be a little, a little, a little, a little violent, a little boxy. And um, so if that's gonna bother you or your kids, you know, I'm, I'm, we, oops, <laughs> you know. <laughs> It's just, that's the movie that we're looking at. So just want you to be aware uh, as we dive in. But the movie is, of course, the culmination of a journey for Adonis Creed. He, he is, he, right, he's the son of Apollo Creed. How many of you love the Rocky movies? Come on, somebody. All 907 of them. Let's go. Sylvester Stallone been making movies for three centuries. That's all I'm saying. Rocky movies and, and you know, whether you were the, the Rocky fan or the Creed fan, or maybe you were the villain fan in the movies, you were all about, you know, Drago or all about Clubber Lang. How many of you remember Cl Clubber Lang? Who remembers Clubber Lang? That's what I'm talking about, Tim, right there, right? I'm like no fool, right? He just, he just had a voice and a thing and he was mean. And um, so we, we, got the, we got the in it, we got the kind of the villains and we've got Rocky and, and Apollo and they have this tension. And of course, the, the, the whole thing hands off to, to Adonis, Apollo's son. And this is the third movie in kind of his journey as a boxer and life unfolding. Now, I doubt there's gonna be, you know, we're gonna get Creed 81, but, it, but it, this is the third one. And uh, if you haven't seen the movie, um, it's an it's a exploration, really, of Adonis's life, but really going all the way back to his childhood. His modern day life, his current life. I mean, the dude's been crazy successful, champion of the world. He holds all the belts. He's got the multi-billion dollar mansion. He's got the beautiful little daughter. He got the pool out on the back. He sits out there by the pool with his little girl in his dinosaur outfit having tea. Like, a lot of money, a lot of cars, a lot of business, a lot of success. Like, has it all. He got it all. And we meet Adonis in this movie in the tension between the presentation of a character from his early life and his current beautiful life. There's a journey he walks, and if, we're, if, we, if we pay close attention, I think we can see a few things about it. But Adonis has a moment early in his life, and we'll talk about it in a minute. Uh, we're gonna, we're gonna show you, kind of introduce you to Adonis in just a minute. But what I, but I want you to write something down as we get started. Before we get into this first clip, I want you to write this down. This is your big idea for this message. And I'm telling you, if you will begin to lean into living this, it will begin to be transformative to your soul. And this is your big idea. Our most significant fights are spiritual, not physical. Our most significant fights are spiritual, not physical. Anybody ever been in a physical fight? Anybody ever been in a fight? She put her hand up and then took it down real quick. All I'm saying, I looked over there, Danielle, she was like, you? I don't know if I want my pastor to know. I beat somebody up. I don't know about that. Physical fights are hard. Say, how many, how many ever know somebody, maybe you've lived a life a little bit with a chip on your shoulder, like you were in, in that place where almost anything could draw you into a physical fight. If it was the wrong thing at the wrong time by the wrong person, we gonna have to go. Physical fights are a thing, but I'm telling you, as present and as real and as hard and as in your face, in the moment, challenging as physical fights can be, the most significant in your fights in your life today and in your future are actually not the physical ones, they're the spiritual ones. 
They, they are the inside ones, they're the internal inside David, uh, personally inside me, as well as what is going on in the supernatural around me. Now, again, if you're new to church, if you're new to faith, if you're exposed, you, this may be a little bit like, Ugh, I don't know what to do with this. And so I wanna, I wanna read a, a passage of scripture to you because what we watch Adonis go through in the movie is battle some internal things while he also has to face some external things. He has to wrestle through some internal stuff as much as he has to deal with the fists in his face or in his ribs. It's a, it's a real battle. And how many know when you're facing external battles, the internal battles feel even harder? How many know when you're facing an external battle, it's hard to even focus on the internal battle because the extra pa pa pa. I can't pay much attention sometimes to what's going on inside me or what God is, is trying to work in me or what the, what the supernatural realm, the battles that are going on that affect me, my family, my friends and people around me because I'm getting punched. It's difficult, but I'm telling you that the most significant ones are the spiritual ones, not the physical ones. Here's the way Paul said it in the book of Ephesians chapter six, verse 12, in the New Living Translation. We're gonna read a little bit more around this in a moment, but here's what he said. He says, for we, that's those of us that are followers of Jesus, are not fighting against flesh and blood enemies. I, wanna hear, I want you to hear this. If you've not chosen Jesus, he's not saying you don't have any spiritual battles. He's speaking to those who've chosen Jesus, but it is as true of all of us, just if you don't yet know Jesus, the ability to fight a supernatural battle is virtually impossible. Until you come into a place of surrender to Jesus, awareness of who God is, the surrender to his will, the willingness to lay your life down and let him lead your life, the ability to fight supernatural battles is limited or absent. So when he writes to the church at Ephesus, he's not just saying only Christians fight spiritual battles. <laughs> it's not what he's saying. What he is saying is, y'all know that this is true. If he went and preached it in the, in the, in the you know, courtyard, he would say, there are spiritual battles raging all the time and I wanna help you understand how you deal with them. In fact, a little bit around this passage in Ephesians 6 does that very thing and we'll get to that in a minute. For we are not fighting against flesh and blood enemies, but against evil rulers. Everybody say evil rulers. Evil. Last week we talked about honoring all rulers. He says, for we are fighting against evil rulers and authorities of the unseen world. Against mighty powers in this dark world. And against evil spirits in heavenly places. You're like, Pastor David, this sounds like a, a Halloween scripture. <laughs> The unseen world, evil spirits, authorities, principalities, demons, I'm, I'm just telling you, it's abundantly real. And if we get lost in physical battles and, and don't pay attention to the real battles, our physical battles will drain us, but the real loss is not whether or not I feel tired or fatigued or end up in my bed. The real loss is if my soul is lost. So we, we, we've got to get some kind of context and prioritization. So... What does this look like a little bit in this movie? What we see in the movie is Creed, not so much Adonis, not so much fighting spiritual battles, but fighting his inside as well as his outside. And what does this look like? You need to meet Adonis. If you haven't seen the movie, this is Adonis Creed. the beginning of his journey, he walks into a place with a guy that's supposedly his best friend, Damien, Dame Diamond, Dame Anderson. And, and Dame has this fight and he's the up and coming Golden Glove boxer. And so we see him fight, but Adonis is kind of carrying his, his gloves, carrying his water bucket and puts a bed on him. And we see Duke kind of see that and, and Duke becomes his coach. He knew his dad, all this stuff. And so there's this moment as a child. And as the movie unfolds, we see more of what really took place that night. Not just the fight, but what came after the fight. Because life changed in an instant for Damien and for Adonis when they were kids outside a liquor store after that fight. And what we, what we see in the second part of the clip is Adonis at his peak. He's retiring from boxing. It's his step away from the fight game kind of moment. He's fighting. And of course, I, I, I love the way they connected the checkmate moment. The checkmate early on when he looked over, Dame said, you know, checkmate and then takes the guy out. And then Adonis says to his coach in his final fight, 
He's retiring. He says, checkmate. I'm going to end this thing and I'm going to go out like I came in. And he does. And so as we could be so celebrative, so expectant for what Adonis has achieved, what he's come to you know, manifest in his life, overcoming the challenges of his childhood, which we don't even know him all yet, but going through what he's going through. And of course, he's rocking the black mustache like his dad. You know what I'm saying? A little, a, little, a little Apollo Creed mustache going on. So he's, he's following dad's footsteps. He's got all this stuff. But what we don't yet know is just how bad the battles that are going on inside really are. I want you to write this down. Misunderstanding the fight leads to wearing the wrong armor. Misunderstanding the fight leads to wearing the wrong armor. In other words, when we, when, we, when we don't have the right enemy figured out and we don't have the right fight figured out, we'll end up wearing the wrong armor. Anybody ever uh, played sports in high school, middle school, high school, maybe when you were a kid? Come on, there's a lot more of you that consider yourselves athletes and hands went up, come on. All right, so you, when you play, can you imagine showing up for the basketball game, you're on the basketball team and you show up for the basketball game wearing cleats and shin guards? Your coach would be like, bro, that season's over. That's not, the, that's not what we're playing tonight. If you shut up for the soccer game in football pads, the coach would say, hey, 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 wrong field. This is a wrong fight. This is a wrong game. You need to go over there. You are now equipped for what's going on over there, not what's going on right here. And if we, if we as Men and women who are seeking to know Jesus, those that are trying to figure out how do I walk forward in dealing with the, the difficulties of life. If we misunderstand the fight we're in, we'll, it, it will lead to wearing the wrong gear. And we watch we watched, uh, Adonis walk this out all through this movie. Over and over and over, we see him in conversations with his wife, conversations with Duke, even conversations with Dame that would indicate his, it's like his, his lens, his perspective on the real fight is just off. It's, it's like he's got double vision. He's fighting the shadow instead of the real fight. The whole movie. And so if you and I can get our arms around and our mind around and our spirit around, the fights that we're facing are actually not the people in front of us with the gloves on. They're actually the people we can't see. It actually isn't the physical. It's the spiritual. Then we'll equip ourselves for the right fight. And in that passage in Ephesians chapter six, the Bible actually equips us. Paul actually speaks to us about what we're to put on, right? In the boxing ring, they have to go in the back. They get taped up. They put the gauze on. They put the gloves on. They wear the mouthpiece. They got the the super deco shorts with their name and like and the boot, like they got that's the gear they wear but what is our gear if the real fight is not requiring boxing gloves and mouth guards what do we actually need we actually need this is Ephesians chapter 6 now interestingly verses 11 and verse 13 which are the verses before and after the, the verse I've read you already, chap, uh, verse 12, about fighting against, not against flesh and blood enemies. Around it on either side, it says, so it's, it's emphasized before and after that statement. It says that we need to put on the whole armor of God. It says, it says therefore, put on the whole armor of God. And then it says, because you're not fighting physical battles, you're fighting spiritual ones. And then it says again, so put on the whole armor of God. Like, I mean, just put yourself in a very practical situation. Paul was, was writing to us. He was equipping human beings to live in the midst of a spiritual battle. He was saying, you're in your flesh and blood. We live on this earth. We'll live and we'll die. If we get punched, we'll bleed. If we get tripped, we'll skin our knee. We're physical, but the battles that are outside of us require preparation, and they're the real battle that can really derail everything. So you need to put on the right things for that fight. Remember, it's not physical. Put on the stuff! Anybody ever have a parent, like, double remind you something? Anybody have a mom say to you, you know, hey, um, clean your room. And then they go, yep, somebody, clean your room. And then their mom goes over and cleans the kitchen or wherever she does. Then she comes back and she goes, and clean your room. <laughs> Anytime you're told twice, how many know that means it's kind of important? Oh, yeah. And so here's what Paul says to us. Put on the whole armor of God. And this is, this is what he then proceeds to describe for us. He says, so stand therefore. Having fastened on the belt of truth and having put on the breastplate of righteousness. And as for shoes for your feet, 
having put on the readiness given by the gospel of peace. In all circumstances, everybody say all, all. not just the ones you like. In all circumstances, take up the shield of faith with which you can extinguish all the flaming darts of the evil one. And take the helmet of salvation and the sword of the spirit, which is the word of God, the Bible, praying at all times in the spirit with all prayer and supplication. And to that end, keep alert with all perseverance, making supplication for all the saints. And as I read through this passage, as I read through it, prayed through it, thought about my own life, my wife's life, my kid's life, and had some little bit of thinking about your life. I thought, my gosh, it's almost like he's describing getting geared up for a boxing match. Like they wear belts to protect them. They, they don't get to wear a breastplate, but they wear the right boots, uh, the, just the right thing for what they got to do. They, they have, they, they're constantly told, keep their guard up, a shield of faith with which you can extinguish every, every enemy's flaming dart. Like I promised the guy in the ring wants to beat the snot out of you. You got to protect yourself. And take the helmet of salvation. You ever watch boxers spar? They put on this helmet. They kind of keeps them from getting concussions and cauliflower ear and all this stuff. Cauliflower ear. I just, first of all, I hate the word cauliflower, but that's a different subject. <laughs> and the sword of the spirit, which is the word of God. And so I was, I was thinking about you and about me and about our preparation. I think most of us, most of the time, even those of us that have walked with Jesus for a long time can put more of our energy into our physical preparation for life in general. Too often, we can be more preoccupied with our gym time and our sit-ups and our push-ups and our bench press and our deadlift and all the physical preparation to sustain natural life. And it's understandable. We're human beings living in, in a physical earth for a brief time, literally a mist. And our attention can be preoccupied with physical preparation instead of spiritual protection. And so I just, since the real battle isn't the one that we're facing in the natural, wouldn't it, wouldn't it make sense to put more priority or at least some priority on getting ourselves equipped day by day and week by week, praying through all, at all times in the spirit and persevering with a sword in our hand, remembering salvation that covers our mind, the gospel of peace that shods our feet, and the breastplate of righteousness, which we cannot earn. It's been given and imputed to us because of Jesus. We're righteous because of him. It protects our heart. The center mass of our being is completely protected by the righteousness that is Jesus. And so, so what, are we, what are we doing being more concerned with the, the, the size of our bench press or our deadlift than, than we are our confident awareness of the righteousness of Christ that we live in, the salvation that's been bestowed upon us that is a protection and guard over our mind, the sword of the spirit that is both a weapon of offense and defense. What do we do with that? And have we prioritized the wrong battle? Now, Dame, uh, you know, kind of wants to insert himself, we, we discover, into Adonis's life. As you watch the movie, Dame shows back up. Adonis has all this success, but one day he walks out to his car and, and Damien, his childhood friend, who was this incredible boxer, golden glove guy, shows back up. And what we come to learn is that Damien ended up in jail, prison for 18 years because of a moment in, in their childhood after that fight. And so Dame shows back up, Adonis walks outside, they reconnect, but in their reconnecting, Adonis is forced to come face to face with some things in him about both his past, uh, uh, Dame's past, their loss of connection, the journey of him being in prison. And we begin to discover that Adonis is wrestling with things like guilt and shame and hardship. And he's anxious. And how do I make up for things that I think are my responsibility? Anybody ever wrestled with false responsibility? You've taken responsibility for something that actually isn't your responsibility? 
And we can see Adonis beginning to walk in this. Oh my gosh, what is going on? He's back in my life. How do I walk this out? And when Dame presents himself back in Adonis' life, it feels like this is a moment of re-engagement. Hey, little bro. And they're having these moments together and they get some food together and they're talking together. And Dame wants to box. And Adonis says, sure, we'll train you. And he brings him back, starts to fold him in, trying to sort of make up for all of the mistakes and the bad that he thinks he's created that, that, that Dame ended up paying for. He's wrecked. You can see it every conversation. Moments in the mirror. His, just his facial expression with Dame is like, oh, there's more going on here than I can deal with. I under, listen, I understand how to stand in the ring and exchange punches. I don't know how to deal with what's going on in me and around me. Aren't we that way a lot of times? I can handle the physical difficulty. It's the spiritual warfare and the internal warfare that I don't know what to do with. In fact, like Adonis, we can find ourselves masking those battles with these. Uh-uh. If I can hit somebody, if I can, if I can attack something and deal with something in the physical, I don't have to wrestle with, with things that aren't flesh and blood. And so we discover some things about Dame as we go. And what we discover is that Dame has an agenda. How many know that the enemy has an agenda? And so Damien has an agenda, and we get a chance to see a little bit of it in this next clip. Damien had sent letters to Adonis all the time he was in prison, and Adonis never got him. And at a party his wife was throwing, a guy showed up and broke the arm of the contender that was supposed to fight one of Adonis's fighters at his, at his uh, gym. And we saw the picture as Adonis was on the phone of the guy that did it. And his mom says, we need to talk. And when he gets there, she shows him the picture of the guy who in prison became close to Damien that he ended up using to mess up Adonis's plan for a fight for the guy in his gym and force a fight that ended up giving Damien the championship. There was an agenda that he had the whole time and he posed as a friend. He presented himself as we're brothers. I'm back. We, we'd be connected. Like he said to him, we're going to be in this together. I've got you. You got me. We're, we're in this together. And Adonis believed it and went on to try and help him. And there was an unknown agenda the whole time. Here's what I want you to write down is the enemy of your soul has designs for you to distract, detour or destroy you. There is intention and purpose behind what is taking place in the supernatural that has an outcome for you that you might not see or I might not see because my lens is more on the current physical battle or because it's uncomfortable and difficult or because I'm not equipped to fight it. And here's what the enemy is about. Listen to this. This is 2 Corinthians chapter 2, verses 10 and 11. Paul says, anyone whom you forgive, I also forgive. Indeed, what I have forgiven, uh, if I have forgiven anything, has been for your sake in the presence of Jesus. So that we would not be, look, outwitted by Satan, for we are not ignorant of his designs. There is an enemy who has an intention for your life that is not for your good and he ain't gonna walk up and go, hey, put the gloves on, let's box. It is in a realm in the supernatural against you, against me to distract detour or destroy us. First Peter chapter five says, be sober and vigilant because your adversary, the devil walks about like a roaring lion. Uh, right now, my little two-year-old grandson, Jet, is making animal sounds and we were playing last night and I, and, and I said to him, hey, Jet, what, is, what does a lion say? And he goes, roar. I said, what does a tiger say? Roar. What does a, a bear say? Roar. What does a dinosaur say? Roar. It was like, does every animal say, roar? Like, there is a roaring lion seeking whom he may devour. Resist him, steadfast in the faith, knowing that the same sufferings that you experience are experienced by your brotherhood in the world. I want you to just, you can jot some of these th things down real quick. I'm not sure if they're on screen, they might be. But the first thing is this, a distraction is a thing that prevents someone from giving full attention to something else. The enemy will do whatever he can to get you distracted. And in a boxing match, y'all have seen the, the, the funny moments where a boxer will be in the ring and he'll kind of wave his hand over here, hoping that his opponent will look over there because the moment he's distracted, boom, he can hit him right on the chin. 
If our attention is distracted or, or kind of moved off of the real enemy, we'll find ourselves open to getting hit in the face spiritually. And the enemy has designs on hitting you in the face. Distraction is a thing that prevents someone from giving their full attention to something else. Here's what a detour is. If, if he can't distract you, if he waves it over here and you're like, no, 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 no. Then next, maybe he'll detour you. It's a long or roundabout route that is taken to avoid something. It's the, hey, how many of you like driving and you hit a detour? Anybody like, I love that. That's the greatest thing in the world. No one puts their hand up. Detours stink. Yes. I'm trying to get to a destination and now you're going to make me drive over this way. That's the road I take. No, no, no. We're going to go a different way. And a detour is actually in real life, right? We, we got to get around something, but we're going to try and get you back on the right path in the natural. But that isn't the intention of the enemy of your soul. A detour is a long or roundabout route that is taken to avoid something. And if the enemy can, he'll get you to turn and take another roundabout pathway. And there could be very well something in the middle of the pathway you were intending to walk, that God was walking you in, that was for your good. Even if it was bumpy, it might be good for you. And the enemy might detour you to a place that feels smoother and easier, but it actually costs you something. Thirdly, he'll destroy you if he can. And destroy means to put an end to the existence of something by damaging or attacking it. And I'm telling you that there are designs. The enemy has designs on your life. And he did for, for Adonis, of course. We find Adonis dealing with all of this kind of stuff. And it, finally the agenda comes clear and he confronts Dame. Like, what were you doing? What was, oh my gosh. And it's starting to materialize. Oh my gosh. And Damien goes on in this scene and he says, you know, I'm the champ now. And little bro, you don't know what it's like watching someone live your life. So I'm coming for it all. In other words, I've taken a little, but I'm gonna take it all. And I want you to hear this. The enemy would love nothing more than to completely take all of you. All of you, not all of us collectively, but individually, all of you. Have you completely off track? Have you completely detoured? Paying attention to the wrong things? Destroying your life in all kinds of decision making? If he could distract, detour, and destroy you, he'd be happy. Yeah. And so we have to not only be aware there's an agenda, we have to pay attention to the agenda. We have to be equipped to fight the right battle. And if we'll do that, then we have, in my opinion, we have one other thing we have to pay attention to. There's probably a bunch, but one other thing I want to point out to you today. As uh, the movie starts to draw to a close, Adonis challenges Damien in the ring. And you can anticipate that in the movie, right? There's, there's going to be a moment when they're going to have to box. And Adonis challenges him, and they end up in a fight. Because Damien's won the titles. Adonis wants to prove that he's not better. Damien wants to steal his whole life. Like, there's a massive confrontation. And they end up in the ring. And um, boxing away. And uh, there's, there's a couple of moments in this last fight that I think are critical and uh, will illustrate this last point for us. Go ahead. The line that he gives him there in the, in the corner. Because Adonis, the scene we just saw was Adonis hmm, was still captivated by his past. All he could see was, was Damien, the kid, and all he could think of was Adonis, the kid, and they're boxing it out in this kind of mental boxing match. And he ends up in the corner, and what does his coach say to him? He says, hey, I need you to stop boxing and start fighting. Let go of all the fear. Let go of all the shame. Let go of all the guilt. Let go of what was. Walk into what it is. Here's what I want you to write down. Letting the enemy keep our focus on our past keeps our future at risk. What God has for you in the days, months, and years ahead is not going to be one in the natural, but it's certainly not going to be one as long as our eyes and our life are trying to live overcoming or dealing with or facing what is in our past. What, what really we have to do is say what has happened in the past, what has been done in the past, the, the mistakes that we've made, the, the things that we've done in the natural, whatever, are, are not going to be the things that define us. And that's really what his coach was saying to him is stop living in the past. Let all that stuff go. Walk into what is you fought hard to build a life. There's all this blessing. Like stop living there. And this is 
how Paul says it in the book of Philippians chapter three. He says, I don't mean to say that I've already achieved things or I've already reached perfection, but I press on to possess the perfection for which Christ Jesus first possessed me. No, dear brothers and sisters, I haven't achieved it, but I focus on this one thing, forgetting the past and looking forward to what lies ahead. I press on to reach the end of the race and receive the heavenly prize for which God through Christ Jesus is calling us. So today, my hope is that you step away from our opportunity to gather and worship and grow in the things of God collectively in community and recognize that God is calling you and has been awaiting to walk with you in the turning from your past to your future, letting go of what you've done because he's taken care of it all because of Jesus and moving you into a place of walking into what he's provided for you. And along the way, the battles that you fight are designed by the enemy to keep you from walking into it all. That you'll never possess the prize, the full measure of what he's made available, what he's called you to, if you let him distract you, if you follow the detour, or if you surrender to destruction. It is only by putting on the weapons for the right fight that we'll find ourselves experiencing the victory that there is in Christ Jesus. So here's what I'd like you to do. Bow your heads and close your eyes today as we close. I wanna pray over us. And then I know there are some of, some of you in here who've never said yes to Jesus. And I wanna give you a chance to receive the victory. He's already won in just a moment. Father God, I thank you for your word that is true. I thank you, God, for your encouragement to fight the right fight. I thank you for the weapons that are available to us that you have made visible and declared for us in your word, which is always right and true. And today, God, we just acknowledge to you as a body of believers that it is too easy to fight the physical fight and neglect the spiritual fight. It's too easy to fight the wrong enemy instead of the right enemy. It's too easy to see ourselves looking in a rearview mirror instead of straight straight ahead into the victory and future that you've won for us today. And so God, each of us now, right now, inside, we declare from our spirit, in our mind, and with our lips, God, that we will have our intention and our focus and our priorities aligned rightly. That the enemy of our soul is a more dangerous enemy than the enemy of my body. And starting today, God, our fight will be against that enemy more than any other. Starting today, God, we will walk in the full measure of your authority and power that is in Christ Jesus and we will defeat the enemy that comes after us like a roaring lion. We will stand in the face of the enemy in a spiritual war standing in victory because of Jesus. You are mighty God and we stand in the victory that Jesus has won today. And if you're in here and you've never surrendered to Jesus, but you want to walk in that, then this is your moment. I'm going to count to three. I want you to put your hand up real high, and then our whole church is going to pray with you a prayer of surrender to Jesus. The Bible says he's the author and finisher of our faith. The Bible says that he made a way and overcome the grave on your behalf, that he's defeated the devil in an eternal sense so that you can live forever in right standing with God instead of apart from him. And that new eternal relationship and right standing can begin Today, if that's you, right now on the count of three, put your hand up. One, two, three. Who would say that's me? Thank you. Who else? There? Thank you. I see that hand. Thank you. I see that hand and that hand and that hand. I see that hand over there. Thank you, sir. Who else would say that's me? Thank you. So many hands today. Thank you, Jesus. I'm so proud of you. I see that hand. Thank you. Oh, so good. Thank you, Lord. Well, all of you who raised your hands, you can put your hands down. And church, can you join them in declaring loudly a surrender to faith in Jesus? Everybody together say, Heavenly Father, come on real loud. Heavenly Father, I thank you for Jesus. I thank you for sending him, that he died for me, and that you raised him back to life. Today, God, I ask you to forgive me for all of my sin. Would you make me new because of Jesus? And today, Jesus, we surrender to you. We call you our Lord and our Savior. It's in your name that I pray. Amen and amen. We celebrate those who just made a decision for Jesus.